Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to be able to open today's debate on the introduction of the Scottish Government's Cost of Living Tenant Protection Scotland Bill. And in doing so, I want to express my thanks to everybody within government who has worked so hard at an extraordinary pace to make this possible. Almost a month ago, the First Minister launched this year's programme for government, which was published in the context of a severe cost crisis, a crisis that poses a danger not just to livelihoods, but to lives. Now, at that time, perhaps we thought it couldn't get much worse, but thanks to the frankly astonishing actions of the UK government in the last two weeks, it has. Make no mistake, this has the makings of a humanitarian emergency. This Parliament doesn't have all the levers we really need to fully tackle this crisis, but we are determined to do what we can with the powers we do have to protect those who need it most. Now, tenants have, on average, lower household incomes, higher levels of poverty, and are more vulnerable to economic shocks. 63% of social rented households and 40% of private rented households don't have enough savings to cover a even a month of income at the poverty line. That's compared to 24% of households buying with a mortgage and 9% who own outright. Not many households will escape the cost crisis altogether, but tenants are just so much more exposed. That's why this bill will provide tenants in the private and social rented sectors, as well as college and university halls of residence and purpose-built student accommodation with greater protection. The UK government's response to the energy crisis through the energy price guarantee does fall far short of what's needed to help protect people uh, from severe financial hardship. And we anticipate that as a result, many more tenants will fall into fuel poverty and extreme fuel poverty over this winter. Tenants don't just need help with their housing and energy costs. They need to feel secure at home over the winter. Now, with that context in mind, the cost of living bill has three key aims. Firstly, to protect tenants by stabilizing their housing costs by freezing rents. Secondly, to reduce impacts on the health and well-being of tenants caused by being evicted or being made homeless. And thirdly, to reduce unlawful evictions. But in addition to these important measures to protect tenants, the government also recognises that not all landlords are in the same financial position. So we include in the bill necessary safeguards, which will give them flexibility where it is genuinely needed. It's the intention for these provisions to last until at least 31st of March next year. And I'll go through these provisions in some detail now. First, the rent freeze. Uh, yes, I'll take an intervention. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer, and I'm very grateful to the Minister giving way at this stage. One of the impact assessments that rightly has been published is the Child Rights and Wellbeing Impact Assessment, which says um, the impact of the cost of living crisis, particularly on our young people. Is the Minister confident that this document also considers those people who are children, i.e. under the age of 18, but are in fact tenants through their university or higher education position, given their role as still being young people, um, given that the UNCRC isn't on the statute book yet, but the intention is to support um, the protections therein? Minister. Uh, the impact assessment does aim to, to capture these points, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll perhaps, if I can, take the opportunity to address that in the closing uh, speeches later, uh, if that's okay. Uh, the bill allows for Scottish ministers to set a cap on the level of increase in rents initially at 0% until the 31st of March. Under these proposals, ministers will take powers to vary the cap and it will operate separately for the social and private rented sectors. Students in college, uni university, halls and PBSA will also be protected through a 0% cap, ensuring there'll be no mid-tenancy rent increases. Um, this, uh, in, in just a moment, uh, this applies to all rent increase notices served af on or after the 6th of September. And as, uh, as I've said, we recognise that the cost crisis is also impacting on some landlords. And while the primary purpose of this legislation is about protecting tenants, it's also important to ensure it reflects landlord circumstances. So private landlords will be able to make an application to increase rent for limited prescribed and legitimate costs associated with offering the property for rent where those costs have increased. This will be for 50% of these costs, uh, or up to 50%, and no more than 3% of existing rent. Those percentages may be varied uh, if circumstances justify it. I give way. 
Ros McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, thank you very much to the Government Minister for allowing me to do my first intervention. Um, as a Glasgow MSP, I'm sure Mr Harvey will be aware uh, that the mere mention of this bill has made a significant contraction in the amount of the rental market that there is, and that's directly affecting students, especially in Glasgow University, where they have been reported to be instructed uh, not to uh, even enrol if they can't find accommodation. So will the government minister agree that the real impact of these proposals will actively make it harder for students to rent flats? And this will create another barrier to Scotland's deprived young people from a disadvantaged background and attaining a university education. Minister. Well, I, I welcome the, the member to the chamber. I haven't had a, se a chance to say that on the, on the record, but I do strongly disagree with her suggestion that the situation facing students uh, in particular, the, the new intake of students in Glasgow and Edinburgh is a response to this bill. I don't think there's any connection at all. Um, now, I mentioned the private rented sector, and there are, of course, critical differences between the private and social rented sectors. For social landlords, there are already requirements for how rents are consulted on and agreed. And tenant participation and consultation uh, is, uh, a, in, in rent setting is a really valuable part of our current system. Social landlords are not for profit bodies. Their rents are channeled back into quality of homes, uh, services for tenants, and public investment in housing. That's why we are working in partnership with the social rented sector to consider the implications of any use of these rent measures after the 31st of March. I told Parliament last week, and I emphasise again now, no decision has been made about any use of these measures after March, and any such decision will be informed by dialogue with the sector. I'd like to turn now to the... Um, I'll, um, I'll take a, an intervention from over here and I'll try and come to Miles. Katie Clark. I'm very grateful to the Minister. And on that point, in terms of what, what happens after the 31st of March, is the Minister giving consideration to whether it might be possible to get rent controls legislation, even if it was through temporary emergency legislation and a temporary scheme in place more speedily i.e. rather in months rather than in years. Minister. Well, we are working at pace to get this legislation in place within weeks, uh, and we're working in, in close dialogue with the, the social rented sector. Uh, and I think there are already good creative ideas coming forward uh, about how we'll work together with the, the sector. Uh, turning to the uh, provisions on evictions, these measures prevent the enforcement of eviction action in the private and social rented sectors and in college and PBS, college and university halls and PBSA, except in a number of specified circumstances. I'm, I'm going to make a little bit of progress on the eviction measures and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let members in in a moment or two. Once again, it's vital that this emergency legislation reflects a range of circumstances that face both tenants and landlords and ensure that responsible landlords do continue to offer properties in the private rented sector. Recognising these factors, as was the case with the eviction measures in the coronavirus legislation, we have allowed for a number of exemptions from the moratorium. These are a mixture of existing eviction grounds and new temporary grounds for evictions which we've developed. This includes allowing evictions in cases of criminal or antisocial behaviour to protect other tenants and neighbours from behaviour that can have a hugely damaging impact on communities, in cases where a tenant has abandoned a property, in cases of repossession by len lenders to ensure uh, that there's continued lender confidence in the sector, uh, and also in cases where a landlord intends to sell the property or to live in the property specifically to alleviate financial hardship or prevent their own homelessness. These last two grounds uh, are new. In effect, they're existing versions, uh, versions of existing grounds, but with the important caveat that financial hardship must be demonstrated, and we'll work with the tribunal uh, to support implementation of this. Uh, if Mr Balfour would like to come in. Uh, can I thank Balfour. the Minister. I wonder if you can maybe clarify the situation for me. In regard to university students, if they don't pay their rent but can't be evicted, uh, the normal place is that you, you then are not allowed to sit your exams and go on to the next year. Does this legislation supersede that, or would universities still have the right to stop people sitting exams and going on to another year if you don't pay their rent? Minister. Well, I'm, I'm aware that there have been some concerns expressed uh, that some, and I think a minority of tenants, uh, it, would, it would always be suggested, uh, might be tempted to stop paying rent even if they can afford it. And that's where I'm going to move on to the, the additional ground for eviction, which we're exempting 
from the moratorium. We have taken the view that both in the social and private rented sectors, eviction may still take place in cases where there are substantial rent arrears. Uh, I want to lay this out in a little more detail because I know some members have concern about it. For the private rented sector, this means a total value of av at or over six months worth of rent arrears. And for the social rented sector, it means rent arrears of £2,250 or more. That's around six months worth of average rent in the social rented sector. The decision on this has not been an easy one, but having considered it at length, I'm firmly of the view that this will act as a safeguard both for landlords and for tenants. It will allay the concern that a minority of tenants might stop paying the rent even when they can afford it. Ongoing substantial rent arrears can mean a landlord could find it increasingly difficult to offer the property for rent, uh, especially when no rent has been paid for a prolonged period. But in addition, for a tenant facing unsustainable rent arrears, simply prolonging the situation will only increase their debt and financial insecurity and can trap them with debt that they will never be able to service. The protection that a tenant needs in these circumstances is different. What they need is direct support, and we are already making that support available through discretionary housing payments and through the Tenant Grant Fund uh, which was introduced uh, in recent years and which more recently has had additional flexibility added to it to allow it to be used uh, for more recently accrued arrears not related to COVID. I give way to Miles Briggs. Miles Briggs. In regards to the Tenant Grant Fund, that is a loan. Uh, so in terms of going forward, the ministers intend to provide that um, as a grant which would not be paid back to individuals. Minister. The, uh, originally, under the, the, the initial coronavirus measures, there was a tenant hardship loan fund. There is now a tenant grant fund. That's been the case for, for some time. And uh, I'm, I'm going to have to move on, I'm afraid. I've taken quite a, quite a number. Um, as a result of the changes that Parliament approved back in June, uh, any uh, eviction for rent arrears also already has to take into account all of the circumstances of both landlord and tenant as judged to be reasonable by the tribunal or court. And it also has to demonstrate that steps have been taken to help tenants manage or reduce their arrears. The bill also contains uh, a, a provision to ensure that the restriction on the enforcement of, a, of an eviction order applies only for a maximum of six months from when the order was issued. This applies to individual cases and is separate from the consideration of whether or not the moratorium on evictions will be extended beyond March 31st. These restrictions will apply to all eviction orders granted in proceedings raised after the moratorium comes into force and also apply to proceedings raised before the bill comes into force where the eviction notice was served after 6 of September. It will not apply to eviction orders granted in proceedings raised before the 6 of September. Our aim here is to ensure that no one is evicted in a case started after or in response to the announcement of our intention to introduce an emergency rent freeze. Presiding officer, we know that many private landlords are very professional and supported their tenants during the pandemic, but we cannot ignore the fact that a small minority will try to circumvent these new protections, including by trying to unfairly bring existing tenancies to an end. This is an affront both to tenants and to those landlords who follow the rules. That's why the bill uh, also makes some vitally important changes to the way in which civil damages can be awarded for unlawful eviction, making it more attractive for tenants to challenge an unlawful eviction and receive appropriate damages where one has occurred. The provisions introduced today uh, replace the basis for assessment of damages that the tribunal or court can award to a minimum of three times and a maximum of 36 times the monthly rent, though there will be discretion to award a lower amount if that's appropriate. In addition, the legislation will create reporting requirements where a landlord has been found to have unlawfully evicted a tenant. This will act as a strong disincentive to those unethical landlords who would seek to avoid going through the, pro the proper legal process. I'll now turn to the, the measures on rent adjudication. This part of the bill looks ahead to a time when hopefully we'll be entering recovery from the cost crisis and are therefore able to tra support transition out of these emergency measures. A big concern here is that the lifting of the restrictions could lead to a large number of landlords seeking to increase their rent all at once. Returning straight to open market rents could result in significant and unmanageable rent increases 
for tenants and a volatile market. In these circumstances, the existing rent adjudication process would not provide an effective mechanism for determining a reasonable rent increase. So the bill therefore contains a regulation making power to temporarily reform the rent adjudication process to support transition out of the emergency measures and to mitigate any unintended consequence from the ending of the cap. This power will be subject to the affirmative procedure. Uh, I'm afraid I, I do need to, to finish up in, in the next minute or two, uh, ensuring that appropriate parliamentary scrutiny is given to the necessity for any temporary changes proposed. Uh, finally, presiding officer, uh, on the general provisions, we're seeking to commence the bill the day after royal assent. We propose the flexibility to extend the provisions in part one for two subsequent six month period, if parliament agrees, and the powers in part three on rent adjudication will expire at the end of March 24, with the option to be extended by periods of up to one year. Uh, and there will be powers to suspend and revive the provisions in part one, and powers to expire these provisions earlier than March 31st. And similar to the coronavirus legislation, there will be a requirement to review and report on the necessity and proportionality of the provisions in part one, and ministers will be, ministers will be required to bring forward regulations to suspend or expire any provision that is no longer appropriate. So, to conclude, presiding officer, we are bringing forward this emergency legislation in recognition of the fact that people who rent their homes are right now being hardest hit by an extraordinary cost crisis. The bill's primary purpose is to provide the protection necessary for tenants while also recognising the circumstances of landlords. The bill significantly strengthens the protection against unwarranted rent rises and eviction. It sends a strong signal to landlords about the damages that can be awarded for unlawful eviction, and it provides a bridge into the longer-term reforms that I set out in the New Deal for Tenants last December. The safeguards in this bill provide a total package of fair and robust measures. This is a government which confronts the cost crisis head on, a government which gives people stability in their homes and assurance about their rents, a sharp contrast with those who want to cut taxes for the wealthiest and let bankers' bonuses soar. This bill demonstrates conclude, our determination to use all the powers we have to protect the people of Scotland from these harshest of times. Let us hope that all of this parliament will do what's necessary to support tenants. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. And I now